Good evening, good evening, everybody. We'll be starting pretty promptly at 6.30. Waiting, wait for a couple more minutes. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for attending tonight's Zoom, Zoom machine reading with Allison Cobb and Jacqueline Keeler. Um, my name is Jay Ponteri, and I direct the Low Residency Creative Writing Program here at the Pacific Northwest College of Art. Um, we acknowledge that the land where PNCA is located rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tualatin, Kalapulia, Malala, bands of the Chinook, and many other tribes who made their home along the Columbia River. We also acknowledge the systemic policies of genocide, relocation, and assimilation that still impact many indigenous Native American families today. As settlers and guests on these lands, we respect the work of Native nations, leaders, and families, and make ongoing efforts to center Indigenous knowledge, creativity, resilience, and resistance. Tonight's reading, um, the books that are connected to this evening's readings, um, Allison Cobb's book, um, plastic. I love, this is a, my favorite part of Zoom. It's like a show and tell, Plastic and Autobiography and by Allison Cobb and Standoff, Standing Rock, the Bundy Movement and the American Story of Sacred Lands by Jacqueline Keeler. These books are available through small presses um, and I'm gonna put them in the chat um, for everybody. Um, I hope you will um, consider going to those presses and, and procuring these really amazing books. Um, and then um, really quick, um, if you have um, any interest in um, what PNCA's Low Residency Creative Writing Program is doing, putting that in the chat too. Um, we are having a residency on July, I'm sorry, June 24th to July um, uh, 3rd. And we have a very special reading on the July 2nd with Allison C. Rollins, um, Cedar Saigo, and Jess Arndt. Um, all right. Both of these beautiful texts make use of story, inquiry, a variety of creative and critical research methods, reportage, and essay to trace the origins, often laterally, sometimes in a zigzag, in the service of animating old problems that persist. Plastic, the continued occupation and colonization of native lands, 
the continued dislocation of native and indigenous peoples. Allison's and Jacqueline's respective acts of writing gifts of revelation and gifts of resistance guide readers to the problem's sources, not only illuminating various forms of violence, but also drawing connections between what seem like disparate manifestations. The history, for example, the history of colonization in the Americas, in particular, the United States government's illegal and violent use of treaties in the 19th century made possible in the 20th and 21st centuries, the Bundy family's takeover of federal lands in Nevada and Oregon. For example, to consider deeply the ubiquitous use of plastic means drawing connections from the history of World War II and the atomic bond to the history of the very lands we occupy, the, what we call the Willamette Valley, lands that once belonged to the Kalapuya people. As Jacqueline writes in Standoff, quote, to call oneself American is to claim the fruits and spoils of a revolution built from the philosophy and language of Locke, Jefferson, and Paine, something now understood to be the American dream, which the Bundys and their followers call liberty. In contrast, when I say I am Dakota, I am saying I am the child of an agreement my ancestors made with the land itself. In each of these identities, there is a story that defines kinship to the land and the responsibilities that relationship entails." End quote. Both Allison and Jacqueline here grapple with what it means to live interdependently with flora and fauna as part of the land that's always larger than any one single being. In Plastic, Allison describes the albatross, quote, flight. That's not the right word. The albatross glides, its shoulders and elbow, elbow joints locked into place. It avoids the muscle power of flapping. Instead, it snaps open its wings and dips into global wind flows to cross miles of liquid earth, sniffing out squid, crustaceans, and flying fish eggs. No one knew until recently where albatross really traveled. Now people take transmitters inside the bird's upper back feathers so that an antenna sticks out. It sends radio signals to orbiting satellites that use Doppler shifts to calculate the bird's position, jagged, erratic tracks following food across thousands of miles of open water. Eventually the transmitter battery dies and the albatross path disappears from human sight." End quote. So first, um, tonight, Allison will introduce and read from Plastic, and then Jackie will introduce and read from Standoff. Um, and then after that, we'll have a, a, have a brief conversation. Um, if you go to, um, if, you're, if you're with us, Oh my gosh, have you guys been hearing me? Okay, sorry. Um, if you go to the Zoom machine, you can, if you're on the Zoom machine, you can post questions in the Q and A, so feel free, or, or you can just put them in the chat and I'll be kind of monitoring that. Um, but for, for now, um, I would like to, um, I'm honored to introduce uh, PNCA MFA thesis candidate, She's so close to getting that degree in hand. Uh, Kara Hall will read Allison and Jacqueline's biographies. Jacqueline Keeler is a Dine Ihan Tanwan, Dakota writer living in Portland, Oregon. She is editor of the anthology Edge of Morning, Native Voices Speak for the Bears Ears and has contributed to many publications, including, including The Nation, Yes, and Salon. Allison Cobb's book inclu books include Plastic and Autobiography, After We All Died, and Greenwood. Her work has appeared in Best American Poetry, Denver Quarterly, 
Colorado Review, and many other journals. She was a finalist for the Oregon Book Award and National Poetry Series. She has been a resident artist at Jurassi and Playa and received fellowships from the Oregon Arts Commission, the Regional Arts and Culture Council, and the New York Foundation for the Arts. Let's give a vigorous hand to Allison Cobb. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay, for inviting us and for all of the um, thoughtful care and consideration that you gave to both my work and Jacqueline's work. I'm really grateful for that. Um, and thank you, Kara, for um, reading our bios. Kara is a really interesting writer and artist in her own right and looking forward to seeing more of what you're going to do. So um, thank you so much. And thanks everybody so much for being here. I really appreciate you. Um, on a Friday night, I know myself how hard it is to drag oneself back to the Zoom <laughs> at the end of a week. So thank you so much for, for joining. And I'm really honored and humbled to get to read with Jacqueline. Her book is incredible. Her knowledge is encyclopedic. So I'm just excited to hear more from her and have a conversation. Um, I'm just going to read a brief section of um, from Plastic an autobiography. I'm just going to read a little bit of the preface, which just gives a flavor of some of the concerns in the book. Uh, the book starts with an epigraph by Rebecca Solnit. It says, I wanted to trace the lost patterns that came before the world was broken and find the new ones we could make out of the shards. The thing turned up in a corner of the yard, just outside the fence. I found it when I went out to take Quincy for a walk. Curved and black, plastic, four feet long, a foot at its widest. I thought at first it was a car bumper. I put it in the grass by the porch. The next morning, it was still there. I sat next to it in the sun and looked closely. It was not the first piece of plastic junk I had sat staring at. For nearly a year, I'd been picking up all the plastic I found on my daily dog walk. I'd been arranging it into patterns, taking photographs. I'd been storing it all up in plastic garbage bags on the back porch. I didn't know exactly why I was doing this. I wanted to understand something. Plastic on the dog walk, plastic on visits to the beach, plastic studding the ground everywhere I looked. I gathered it all up. I am the no and the yes. A line from the poet Hannah Sobelman's first book. It has lived with me for years, sometimes whispering through my mind in its old remembered rhythm. In the poem, Sobelman follows the line with a qualifying phrase. She narrows it, makes it domestic, but I want the raw declaration hanging there on the turn of itself. I am the no and the yes. For nearly half my life, I have worked for an environmental group. I spend most of my days in front of a computer screen, taking in a deluge of information about planetary trauma and emergency. Most of it floods through me, too vast to grasp. But plastic was a shard that stuck. Plastic I could touch, and it could touch me back. I dragged the car part inside the house. Nearly 10 years later, it sits beside me near my desk. I learned this, that the world is not broken or that it has always been shards, kaleidoscopically interwoven, not one world, many threaded through one another like fungus hyphae through soil. Worlds end. As Catherine Yusoff points out in a billion black Anthropocenes or none, some worlds have ended over and over, lives consumed and discarded by individuals woven into systems that give them life and death power. Like settler colonialism, like capitalism, these are systems built by humans, but they exceed individuals. They extend across generations and geographies, planet scale forces of destruction. 
plastic waste stems from this consume and dispose violence. I learned that waste is not an unintended consequence of a miracle new technology. Waste is inherent in plastic production as it accelerated after World War II. In 1945, days before the US military incinerated two cities with atomic bombs, a DuPont executive looked forward to the end of the war and the surge of buying that would follow as soldiers returned home and bought houses and cars, washing machines and refrigerators. The job ahead, he told a group of marketing experts, see to it that Americans are never satisfied. Plastic embodies this infinite desire. Conjured out of gas and oil, the seemingly endless reservoirs of dead plants and animals underlying earth, plastic transmutes death into eternal life. The word plastic refers not to any specific object, just the quality of a material that it is capable of taking shape, an endless stream of new shapes. 40% of plastic goes into packaging to be used once and then discarded, driving endless demand for more. Companies work to keep these facts hidden. When the evidence becomes too overwhelming, plastic clogging roadsides, oceans, living bodies, companies shift responsibility onto individuals through things like anti-littering campaigns and ensure that taxpayers and municipalities pay the tab for managing that waste. The lives harmed at every step, human and non-human, drop out of the equation. The same consume and dispose violence threads through me also. It has benefited me my whole life. I grew up the daughter of a nuclear physicist in Los Alamos, the town that built the atomic bombs, which ended some lives in order to save others perceived to have more value. We are woven into the same net, me and bombs and this car part. For a decade, I followed threads that tie us together through airplanes and sailors, the hydrogen bomb, Pacific Islands, the Nazis, and Heidegger. I followed threads through silence, loss, and grief, through the birth of chemistry and the invention of radar, through patriarchy, empire, and chattel slavery. I followed threads through apologies and their failure, through a pandemic and an uprising and living lungs struggling to breathe, through old wounds and new ones, hurt reverberating, aching to be remembered. This object, a book and its journeys, this broken down car part, its life, this is my no. I have wanted this car part and its entanglements, often ugly ones and painful, to leave me. I have wanted not to have to face in my privilege the terms of its existence. I learned this, there is nowhere to go. The same terms that made this piece of plastic made me, my own body, and each of my breaths. This is also, it must be, my yes. That's that. That's from the preface. Thank you so much. Our next reader is Jacqueline Keeler. Let's give a hand to Jacqueline Keeler. <laughs> Thanks. That's sweet. Yeah, um, I, I was amazing. I really loved the um, language, even in that in the intro. And yeah, I um, so so I started Standoff uh, in two thousand. I started doing the reporting that became Standoff, the book, uh, in two thousand sixteen. Uh, in January two thousand sixteen, I I woke up uh, after the new year and found out that uh, the Bundys had arrived in Oregon, where I live, and uh, and had taken over a wildlife refuge. And, um, and of course, the first thought I had as I watched them up there saying that they'd come to, you know, reclaim this for the loggers and miners and so they could all get back to working again was, um, and of course, the ranching family um, that were at the center of this 
uh, was, uh, was, you know, well, didn't that land belong to Indians? And, and I addressed this earlier, actually, in 2014, I wrote a piece for the nation, which um, really um, examined uh, Clive and Bundy, their fathers, um, when he had the standoff in Nevada in 2014 at Bunkerville, uh, you know, um, I examined his claims to, you know, to be the um, you know, to uh, to be the ultimate owner of the land, right in Nevada, and um, and I juxtaposed those against the claims of um, particularly the Shoshone people and of course uh, the Paiute people as well, and because uh, uh, there are Paiute people that live uh, near the Bundys there in Bunkerville, and there are Paiute people that live at uh, Malheur. That's their traditional their traditional territory is vast. Uh, and, and I learned so much covering this. I, I focused on covering it from the perspective of the a Burns Paiute tribe. And, um, and I covered it primarily for Indian Country Day. I also did pieces for um, other outlets as well. And, um, but, um, uh, and um, I got to be interviewed on Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman and stuff. And, and um, but the, um, I, I, really, uh, I really wanted to bring their, their perspective forward. They did this fantastic press conference and really laid out quite boldly the fact that if they had taken over, and the Malheur Wildlife Ref Refuge is um, about what it's, it, it was originally part of their reservation, the Malheur Reservation, which was about 1.8 million acres. Um, I think the um, the wildlife refuge is about a tenth of that size, and uh, which they had lost um, because of the uh, Bannock War, and they had been forced marched, um, you know, uh, from their <laughs> from their homeland um, in the middle of winter. In fact, I think I had written that um, that uh, Ammon Bundy's takeover had um, unknowingly uh, celebrated the 137th anniversary of that force march of the tribe, um, and some of them were also force marched while they were shackled to get their legs were shackled together and they had to walk all the way up to what is now the Yakima Reservation in Washington State and it's a five-hour drive to get to uh, to the Malheur Wildlife Refuge from Portland Oregon um, I would say it's another um, almost two-hour drive to get up to the Yakima Nation from here it's quite a long walk in the middle of winter and this is what they were forced to do so I am um, I started there and then at the end of the year in December of 2016 I was covering the um, takeover uh, at Standing Rock another takeover I should say um, the uh, you know the uh, uh, the camp there the Ocheti Shakoan camp that emerged there at Standing Rock uh, and um, I'd been hearing about what was going on for quite a while in fact when I was working on Edge of Morning um, which is about the Bears Ears National Monument I had been, um, you know, receiving reports from my family members about the, about what was going on. My dad is Yankton Sioux, Yankton on Dakota, and the Yankton Sioux tribe was one of the tribes that was suing over the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and so, and Ocheti Shakowin, which was the name of the of the camp there, um, um, opposed to the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, what is is the name for um, what the Great Sioux Nation, what we call ourselves, um, which is um, the seven council fires, of which the Yankton tribe, the Honktawan people, are one of those seven council fires. And um, so, uh, so yeah, so we all have an interest in our homeland and um, and what happens to it, um, particularly, particularly the water. And of course, the man camps that accompany the building of pipelines, um, which is still a threat today. Um, well, hopefully they'll get, hopefully the Biden administration will do something about it. So I, um, but I, um, so writing, I wanted to compare the two um, because of course they were so, the response was so different, right? Um, and, uh, and I mean, I, I don't know how many of you saw, uh, um, followed online, you know, the, what happened to the pro water protectors, uh, even in the middle of winter, uh, you know, having um, water cannons fired at them. I mean, basically, the sheriff of Morton County, which is an illegal county under international law, um, the U.S. occupies that by force. Um, the treaty they signed with the Great Sioux Nation, one of the Fort Laramie treaties, um, actually, uh, that is supposed to be part of our our, our land. Do you know I mean uh, it's there? It's not even supposed to exist as a county. And and the sheriff of that county went and basically conducted with the assistance of a corporation, um, then Energy Transfer Powers. I think they've changed their name since then. But they, um, you know, uh, basically uh, conducted an all-out militarized assault on the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. And the world watched. You know, and and I felt like that basically uh, that this made the military occupation, the nature of the military occupation of Indian land visible to the world.
you know, this is actually what's going on. I mean, when we say that, uh, you know, these land acknowledgements, right, this is, um, this is an occupation. And, um, and so uh, I think that Americans need to understand that to a much greater extent that they, have, they are participants in. And then what the Bundys were basically asserting for themselves and other uh, people <laughs> is their colonial rights. And, and so I'm, I'm going to read a bit from a chapter that really draws a comparison between colonial, colonial identity and that of indigenous people. And, and I'm picking this section particularly because of what Rick Santorum had said, uh, <laughs> made the news on Monday, and uh, what he had said last week to that group of uh, young Christian um, group. And so uh, about, um, I don't know if you've heard it, but uh, he was saying that uh, that this was a Christian nation based on, you know, people coming here for religious liberty. Uh, and um, and I really take that to task in the book in quite a great de amount of detail. And so I'm just going to read um, just a little bit about that. And um, but yeah, the ultimate aim, um, this is a quote that starts this chapter, um, which is from my great aunt Ella um, in her book. And I actually see um, standoff as sort of a part of a trilogy in my family of books. Um, my great great aunt Ella Deloria wrote, speaking of Indians in 1944, looking at the historical and um, present day situation of Indian people. And then her nephew, my grandma's cousin, Vine Deloria Jr., um, who wrote um, the book, uh, um, Custer Died for Your Sins in 1969 after the civil rights movement. And, um, and so I sort of see my book in that chain of books written by family members addressing um, political realities for Indian people and the country at large. Um, the ultimate aim of Dakota life, stripped of accessories, was quite simple. One must obey kinship rules. One must be a good relative. No Dakota who has participated in that life will dispute that. In the last analysis, every other consideration was secondary. Property, personal ambition, glory, good times, life itself. Without that aim and the constant struggle to attain it, the people would no longer be Dakotas in truth. They would no longer even be human. And that's from my great aunt Ella Deloria's book, Speaking of Indians, published in 1944. So does the United States have a homeland? For is it truly a nation? Or is it still just a colony that exists to exploit the homelands of other peoples? The federal government presently recognizes 537 tribes within its claimed territory. This number is continually growing and doesn't include state recognized tribes and indigenous people lacking any political recognition. Although homelands can be shared, this extreme example of, Indian, of, nation, of uh, nations within a nation plainly describes an occupation, not a country, and therefore an ongoing colonial endeavor. If the United States is still a colony, it could be described as a colony without portfolio, that is, without a homeland. It broke with its homeland, Great Britain, during the Revolutionary War in 1776, and now occupies sans terra firma, the homelands of other countries, our nations, native nations. How can you tell if something is a colony? How can you determine if it never stopped being one despite vigorous marketing? Well. Examining how it operates can be enlightening. We can begin with what does a colony do? What is its definition? The Cambridge Dictionary defines a colony rather simplistically as a country or area controlled by a more powerful country. I would go further and describe how it operates, how it functions. A colony extracts resources and wealth from other nations and sends the profits gained from that enterprise back to the ruling elite of its home country. It's 1%. In a colony without a homeland, as I propose the US is, that 1%, that ruling elite is corporations. This should come as no surprise when you remember that corporations founded the United States. The Hudson's Bay Company, the Massachusetts Bay Company, and the Virginia Company, among others. These joint stock companies were formed to meet the high risk and vast costs of exploration and colonization, expenses that even the monarch, the crown itself, could not afford. The French Ancien Regime discovered this after losing its colonies in America and funding the English colonies' revolutionary war against King George III, which became a factor in, in precipitating the French Revolution. 
In exchange for the capitalization of colonial aspirations and the assumption of risk, these early corporations were given rights by the crown, not only to lands and markets, but also to government powers. In India, of course, the East India Company's role evolved over the 17th century from trading to ruling large parts of India in the 18th century, with, which culminated in India's British rule. In 2015, I had the opportunity to attend the hearings for the proposed Keystone XL pipeline held by the South Dakota Public Utilities Commission. There I met a coalition of native activists and leaders and white farmers and ranchers from South Dakota and Nebraska who called themselves the Cowboy and Indians Coalition. Before attending the all-day hearings and embedding uh, with the coalition in their rented house in Pierre, the state capital, I had not spoken to white landowners opposed to the pipelines. As we sat around a dining table after a long day of testimony, they described their outrage and shock when they discovered the U.S. government had given TransCanada, now TC Energy Corporation, a foreign corporation from Canada governmental powers of eminent domain over their lands. These landowners were faced with the hard choice of either giving in to the corporations, demand for right away and risking a pipeline leak that could damage their operations, or fighting an expensive and protracted legal battle with the pipeline company and its army of attorneys, a battle they would surely lose. Looking into these incredulous white men's faces, the first thought that ran through my mind was, don't you know history? How do, you not, how do you not know the history of this country? In my high school history class, I learned about the founding of the earliest settlement in Jamestown and the role the outlandishly named Virginia Company of London Adventures played in it. A company, it's in the name, started the state, that the Commonwealth of Virginia. Who can forget watching Richard Attenborough as Lord Burley tartly inform Kate Blanchett's Queen Elizabeth I that she had to marry because she was inheriting a bankrupt country? with no army. The Virgin Queen lacked the funds to embark on such a risky endeavor as exploration and colonization on her own. She relied on the piracy of sea dogs like Sir Walter Raleigh to replenish her coffers, which technically made her a pirate queen. All of this illustrated to me why a clear understanding of this blend of corporate and government power was necessary to explain not only inv the invasions of our homelands, but the role this fundamental dynamic plays today how this dynamic dictated past outcomes and future ones too, how the age of discovery was funded, how the English came to be in what they call the new world and which my ancestors called our world. Each of these factors play a role in modern, um, uh, each of these factor, factors play a role in our relationships to this day. This powerful and fruitful engine, the modern corporation and its relationship to governance and domination is why the interview I conducted with the white landowners 400 years later is in English. It's also why this book was composed in English. Most farmers in South Dakota are of German, Scandinavian, and or Czech descent. English is not their native tongue either. All people have origin stories. However, there is a distinct difference between the origin story of a colony and that of an indigenous nation. That is the creation of a real people. Um, origin stories operate not merely as history lessons, but as algorithmic functions structured by the nature of the relationships the origin story details. The rules or original structures, oh, sorry, algorithms are a set of rules that precisely defines a sequence of operations. The rules or original instructions, or origin stories describe function like directions given in a recipe or when, and when followed, produce specific outcomes. In the case of a colonial alg algorithm, the pervasive rule is the demand of profitability, free and unbound by Malthusian limits to growth. In a country, particularly an island nation like Britain, these limits were real and created by a set limitation on, uh, of arable land. The end, the end run around these limits is colonization, that is the domination of other people's resources. Applied to the new world, this has culminated in a powerful engine of consumption whose end game appears to be this present specter of catastrophic climate change. The United States origin story begins primarily with a financial incentive driven by colonial interests that are evident in the corporate origin of many of the colonies and in the land speculation that fueled the revolutionary furor of the founding fathers. 
In contrast, an indigenous origin story encodes a set of rules that produces vastly different outcomes. A people's story, that's with a capital P, uh, begins with, trans with a tra transformative contact with a spiritual being and the agreement or original instructions that are made with the being, who is a manifestation of the land itself. When we compare the colonial origin story or algorithm to that of, a pe of the people, as native nations call themselves, a distinct difference in origin um, orientation presents itself. Sometimes indigenous people will call themselves the real people, as is the case of my mother's people, the Diné, Diné or Navajo. In the context of the Bundy worldview versus an indigenous one, the two narratives can be labeled by political sovereign, um, by, um, sorry, uh, by political outcomes desired by protagonists in these respective movements, sovereign citizen versus sovereign nation. These are part of a broader analysis comparing the Bundy takeovers of public lands, an expression of the sovereign citizen movement to Standing Rock, an assertion of an indigenous nation's sovereignty as a people. Depending on the dialect, Dakota or Lakota means allies or friends. This meaning emphasizes the relationships that define them as a people and consequently as a nation. This is exemplified and reinforced by the way my father's people in their prayers with the phrase, we are all related. Lakota Dakota origin stories, stories of us becoming a distinct people, begin meeting, begin with the meeting with the white buffalo calf woman, and her gifts of the champa, the sacred pipe, and the seven sacred ceremonies. My Lala, Phil Lane Sr., my grandmother's cousin, used to say, before we met the white buffalo calf woman, we were not Dakota. Well, we were something else. After we met her, we became Dakota. It was in this meeting with her, a sacred being who was a manifestation of the Great Plains and the Buffalo Nation, Tatanko Iatewa, that we became Dakota. It, it is our origin story as a people. My people, the Dakotas, my great great aunt Ella Delory recalled in her 1944 book, Speaking of Indians, understood the meaning of self-sacrifice, perhaps because their legends taught them that the buffalo on which their very life depended give, gave itself voluntarily that they may, might live. Just a snippet of it. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Wonderful reading. Um, so um, I, I thought I would start off the conversation, but um, welcome, of course, the two of you to um, ask, ask each other questions also. Um, I am really struck um, by um, how much research both books um, um, that, that seem, it seemed evident that both of you have done um, for many years. And I'm wondering um, if there's one, each of you, this is a question for both of you. So if, if, there, if, if you could pinpoint one or two moments where you encountered um, some information that altered the course of your writing in some way or form or altered some sense or plan that you had for it. Um, and like almost like a sort of surreptitious or a sort of um, a gift of writing, or it could have been also become a, an impediment, I guess, um, depending on what that surprise might be. Um, so maybe uh, Jacqueline, we could we could start with you. I want to hear um, from um, I, I, my brother, Allison, go first. Okay, Allison. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you, Jay. That's a great question. And, and first, I just want to say um, such a brilliant um, excerpt from the book, Jackie. And I, I just think your formulation of, you know, the U.S. as a colony without a homeland and, you know, the the ruling elite as the corporations is something that as I was writing the the plastic book just became so overwhelmingly evident, particularly in Texas and Louisiana, where I was spending time with communities that are uh, black communities that are quite literally being wiped off the map by corporate expansion. And I mean, the stark, um, the, the stark differential between 
particularly the lives of people of color, people's lives and, and, the, and the priorities of corporations and how the priorities of corporations are supported and enabled by the state um, is just, it's so stark. Um, and I guess I can, I'll say that because one piece of research that really turned the third section of the book into um, the direction of, of talking with communities and, and, and bearing witness to communities experiencing um, this was I learned that the plastic industry, petrochemical industry, companies like Dow and DuPont and ExxonMobil are um, putting $200 billion of expansion into building new plastic plants on the Gulf Coast. Um, and the reason that they're doing that is because there's all this cheap natural gas from fracking just flooding the market. And they are seeing in their projections the end of gas-fueled vehicles, um, that electric vehicles are coming onto the market. But the global projections for plastic consumption just keep going up and up. So this is their profit now is to in invest in plastic plants to soak up all this natural gas. And so companies you think of as oil companies like ExxonMobil um, actually just when Trump was president cemented a partnership with uh, the Saudi Arabian oil company to build one of the biggest plastic plants in the planet in, in a town called Portland, Texas, which is just outside of uh, Corpus Christi. And you know that this is about the future of these companies. They'll talk in the press about that they're going to become green energy companies, but this is where they're putting their billions of dollars of investment. So when I discovered this, um, I first visited Gulf Coast communities in 2014, um, and it was between when I first made that visit and then when I went back in 2019 and was in communication with those communities in, in between those years that the fracking boom and the plastics expansion really took off. So that was one um, piece of research that just turned the book, um, the urgency of that in, in that direction in the final third of the book. Um, there were a couple other um, really interesting discoveries in the book. I, I knew, I called it an autobiography um, before I knew what that meant. I was, I had a small writing group with um, uh, at least one poet I know is here tonight, Kaya Sand, Portland poet Kaya Sand and Portland poet Alicia Cohen. And I just said one day, I was like, I'm gonna write a book called an autobiography of plastic. And I, I really, I think most of the book is figuring out what that actually meant, what I meant by that. But I knew that I wanted, I knew that I wanted to chronicle these huge changes like climate change and plastic waste and pollution that are so big, they feel abstract. And I wanted to do it by anchoring it in my own biography in my own life. And so one of the things that happened is I was interested in a piece of plastic that was found inside an albatross chick. There's been, you, you may have seen photos of these, the parents feed their babies uh, fish eggs and things from the oceans, but they are now microplastic also and they, they die. They can't take in any more food because they can't pass the plastic. And um, there was a piece of plastic found inside one of those albatross chicks that came from World War II. It had a World War II naval squadron insignia on it. And it turned out the um, pilot of that naval squadron was from right down the road in Woodburn, Oregon. So I was able to locate his son and interview his son. And that, that was a very personal connection. Um, and then I'll just say one, one final thing is that I happened to come across the fact that plastic technology, uh, polyethylene specifically, which was new at the time, was really integral to um, the thermonuclear bomb to making the thermonuclear bomb work. And of, of course, I'm from Los Alamos, where both the atomic and thermonuclear bombs were designed. So that, again, was another thread that pulled my own biography into the book and also into this much bigger net that um, Jacqueline also talks about with the sort of colonial and corporate um, relationships that shape, you know, the fundamentally our whole lives and our destinies um, in such profound ways. So I'll stop there and, and let Jackie go. I want to hear more. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. It's yeah, I am. Um, well, you know, with my approach, what I'm trying to do is set up an analysis of the system of, of how these um, two systems work. Uh, I think that a lot of people don't under, don't know what was lost in colonization because there's so people are not really aware of what indigenous um, cultures or communities um, were and are like. 
you know, and um, and that's why I appreciate the work of my uh, great aunt Ella so much. She devoted her life to documenting uh, not only the language, she was fluent in all three dialects, but also the stories. The, she did a whole series of Dakota autobiographies, which she started in um, interviewing elders in, in 1916 and continued until she died in 1971. And the elders she interviewed um, early on had lived before the Americans came. And um, and uh, and so I I wanted to, and she wrote a great ethnographic novel based on her her knowledge um, called uh, Water Lily, and um, but the so I wanted to show to, to provide a a, a, a critique a, um, a sort of a vessel within which we can understand what's going on. I think that this is the problem is that we don't understand what's going on. We think that it's a, a um, an educational deficit. Uh, you know, I think uh, when we uh, like look like look at the responses to Rick Santorum's statements, um, a lot of it is um, you know folks trying to educate him, uh, you know, sending him tweets saying look at uh, look what the Iroquois Confederacy gave the you know the United States, and I do go into that history and and uh, about what uh, the inter the interplay between the Iroquois Confederacy and the English colonies. Um, but uh, but it, I think that in the end um, that doesn't work and or shaming them doesn't work and yet it's a very real force uh, this force that colonization has unleashed uh, it's a colonization based on white supremacy uh, on uh, on unequal division of you know of uh, of spoils and uh and privilege and, and so uh i think you know looking at the trump years we see quite clearly that uh, um there's a huge divide in this country and this is what the name standoff comes from uh, not just the, the standoffs that happened uh, in in North Dakota and uh, in in the in our territories in the Dakotas and also in uh, here in Oregon, um, but uh, I think that um, we need a different paradigm to understand it and, and how to act. So my hope is by uh, sort of reframing what happened, not only. Uh, uh, and, and I so I look very carefully at um, the sort of the, the talking points of the Bundys because I wanted to address them and to sort of um, understand how they function, uh, how they get so much support, uh, how um, you know why is it that uh, you know ninety percent of white men without a college with with just a high school degree, a high school diploma, why did they vote for Trump? Like ninety nine out of ten, right? Um, that means any of us who happen to be white men. Uh, you know, who don't have, with, with just a high school diploma, we would have voted for Trump if that was us, right? This is, I believe a lot of this is structural, right? I think that it's it's almost not personal in a way, even though it, it affects us that way. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so I, I, that's what the whole paradigm is. That's why I bring up the whole, I go into this whole detail about the differences between how a colony functions and, and, and its effects over time. Uh, you know, we see that, of course, with climate change, as I mentioned, but also, you know, with uh, the constant threat of nuclear winter hanging over all of us, you know, um, that is a constant threat to this day. Um, and, and these are all the results of how um, a, coloni a col colonial system interacts um, with the world and, and, um, and with, with its people. And, and so I had to take on, um, you know, the uh, Revolutionary War because of course the Bundys use the um, language from the Revolutionary War and also um, the creation of the constitution. And also they talk a lot about the common, the common lands, you know, um, they're using language and, you know, the, the power of the sheriff under Anglo-Saxon common law in England. You know, um, they talk a lot about, you know, English common law so I did a lot of research on that and the history of land. And what I found was, was very interesting, you know, in contrast to indigenous people where we have this relationship that's mediated by our agreements with the land itself, right? The Bundys are coming from the um, English tradition, uh, which uh, is, is in their name, actually. Uh, the name Bundy, the surname Bundy, they have, I was, I was actually, um, what made me look up the meaning of the name was because in their house, in, in Clive and Bundy's home in Bunkerville, Nevada, he has a sign on the wall that says, uh, remember what the name Bundy means. So I went and looked it up and, and I was pretty shocked by what they found. It actually means bound servitude. Right, and this is coming out of um, the feudal system, where a um, a commoner would um, seek land uh, from um, a feudal lord, and they would give their bond. They would, you know, they would give their bond, and 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 this was um, it's also with the surname 
Bond comes from, like James Bond. And um, and then they would, um, uh, I guess, uh, allegedly when the Normans invaded and killed off most of the Anglo-Saxon nobility, I was shocked to learn that, um, that they that actually tr transformed more into actual serfdom right where when the lord inherits the land he inherits the bundies right and, and so their relationship to the land they are one with the land in a sense but they are one with the land as property so it's a very different really historic relationship um and which they, they they are not really that aware of um and um and so you know the commons you know the closing of the commons which she was referencing a lot you know was a historical event that happened around the time their ancestors left england right in the 1600s and um that there are the bundy's ancestors actually came to north carolina in the 1600s as quakers shockingly enough and um and so uh which was a you know a really um, quite radical group for the time because they refused to take oaths and all this stuff and and they were being actually killed for it in England, and um, so but they um, but yeah it's um, it, what I found was that to this day uh, the descendants of William the Conqueror and his buddies who came over from Normandy uh, in 1066 they still own most of the land in England. Yeah, yeah, they they did a study, <laughs> a book came out and uh, a few years ago, and what they found was that to this day, the descendants of the Nor of the Norman conquest, the 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 feudal lords who came over, they still their descendants still own about um, I think about seventy percent of the land in England. Yeah, and, and so it's um it's you know go and you know like it's probably a great thing to do go invade someone else's country and in a thousand years you and your friends' kids will still own most of the country. And, and so, you know, when you look at Je the concepts of Jeffersonian democracy built on a yeoman farmer model, that was actually pretty revolutionary for the time because yeoman farmers that owned their own land did not really exist in the old country. And, uh, and so that's promise of land. And so I take apart the Revolutionary War um, and I, what I found is that it was basically a war between elites elites in this country and elites in, in, in England. And, um, and the, you, 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 when you read the biographies of the founding fathers, um, probably accepting um, uh, John Adams, of course, but uh, they're all like the wealthiest men in their time, right? They're, they're all the Gates and Bezoses of their times. And, and, um, and, and when they, they also all share something else in common. They all are investors in land companies, right? Uh, particularly wanting access to Indian land uh, in the Ohio Valley and, of course, the Iroquois Confederacy in New York State, all of these things. And so when when they settled the French in Indian War, uh, and uh, of which I make I have some really interesting historical information there, which is kind of really crazy. Apparently, George Washington, when he was about 20 years old, started a world war. Yeah. In Pennsylvania. That's the thing. And um, and so, which then led to doubling the national debt of both England, of both Britain and um, and France. And uh, and it was because the colonists would, would not stay in their area. They were constantly invading Indian land and the French had claims as well, which which is what sets off this world war. And uh, so they, um, uh, the story is pretty crazy. You'll read it in the book, but the, um, uh, but anyway, so when they are talking about um, merciless Indian savages in the Declaration of Independence, and they're talking about King George III and, um, you know, quartering soldiers and all this stuff and having to pay the stamp tax. They're all, they're actually being asked, they've actually been made to pay for part of the war they started, right, of which they are the only beneficiaries in the end, right. Um, and, uh, and so they want, they, so King George III issues the proclamation line of 1763, which is the main thing that started the war, which said that the colonists could not cross the Appalachian Mountains, okay? And so without, unable to do this, they have no prospects for continued growth, right? And, and so they, so the Revolutionary War, once they win it, they immediately parcel out, you know, the Iroquois Confederacy stood for 1000 years, they parceled out, I mean, I think um, Governor Morris, who was the wealthiest man in the colonies at the time, and who funded the war, um, he actually got, I think, a third of the Iroquois Con Confederacy himself, you know, and, um, and I think George Washington got like 20,000, he already had claims of 20,000 acres in Ohio, they were, they, you know, it was something in which they were directly 
benefit they benefited from and um and, and you know the commoners not so much you know um they got you know they were able to purchase the land from the land companies right and um but uh but they also had a situation where they had worthless money they were being taxed to pay for the revolutionary war by the founding fathers and of course then you have the whiskey rebellion right so um and which uh, george, uh, george washington put down with a lot of force right uh and so um but yeah it's uh it's interesting it's not really what i feel the problem is we we uh we we look at the bundies and people a lot of people get really you know supporting you know this sort of right far right um militia talk uh and um and you know we just saw you know the capital invaded um, by QAnon supporters on January 6th, you know, um, a lot of them having the same ideology that's being spread um, via the internet. And, um, and uh, you know, but the thing is, you know, propaganda, it, and that's really what we know about the Revolutionary War is propaganda. We can't solve our problems with propaganda. You know, not only do we need truth, but we need a way of understanding the world that is actually beneficial. So. So when we want to tackle big issues like what Allison is Alice is describing with plastics, we really we need um, it's you know we need to actually rethink the whole thing, and, and this is really along the lines of what um, Black Lives Matters Black Lives Matter has been discussing. Leaders have been discussing with defund the police. So. Uh, Jackie, I wanted to um, just ask you one really quick follow up question about the Bundys. One of the big um discoveries for me was this um you write about how they are kind of legally hyper focused on this um uh part i think it's in the constitution that basically says the federal government cannot own land outside of dc and that essentially becomes the legal underpinning of the takeovers uh in particular in oregon um and and nevada and that struck me as sort of like, oh, well, this is then this is something they will keep using um, possibly in the future. I wonder if you could say a little bit more just about their, because I think one of the extraordinary things about your book is the legal research. Um, when you're talking about how we don't know um, our history, I think that is one aspect that we don't quite um, really know is the sort of legal history around the constitution and its origins and the sort of philosophers from which it arises and the thinking from which it arises in um in terms of uh, reaching back into england um anyway i'm wondering if you could say just a little bit more about that that sort of legal underpinning that the uh bundies seem to be you know using yeah i am um... There's a there's a in the Constitution they've taken a, a something completely out of context. It's not read constitutionally this way, uh, and uh, but they uh, read this one. I can't remember this, the name of the section right now. But they basically believe that it it states that uh, that um, that uh, the the federal government only has the right to um, the ten miles uh, square around um, Washington D.C. And then other needful places like uh, forts, land for forts and stuff. Other than that, that the, they they think they read it to mean the federal government doesn't have the right to own land, right? And and this is to challenge uh, the public lands. Um, you know, many of these states like Nevada and Oregon um, have are mostly public land, um, own you know uh, federal lands, and um, so they want to challenge that. And uh, and you know states like Utah. Uh, actually um, have passed laws at the, at the state legislature state level to basically um, have public lands um, given to the state so then they can sell them and privatize them right and uh, and of course this was I, I, I noted actually in the intro uh, for edge of morning because I this is also public lands is, is also an issue with the Bears Ears National Monument as well which I wrote my previous book about but um, uh, you know that 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 was actually a plank in the Republican Party was to to you know to convey public lands back to the states. Some states like Nevada only entered the union um, with uh, 
um, prescription that they could not own um, the land, uh, the, this public land. So um, they, that's how they entered the union. I, I don't think it can be changed, but it's also not how it's read um, at all. It's not, that was just having to do with the establishment of Washington, DC. It just has nothing to do with anything. It's not, it's just, but it, it's good at raising um, the, the um, to, to get their followers excited. Um, it's very effective that way. And, uh, the other thing that I brought up um, from the indigenous perspective is um, the um, uh, the fact that uh, under in, in, uh, under federal um, uh, law, uh, constitutional law, uh, there's a, a sector called Indian federal law, and this applies to all federally recognized tribes. Right? We all share this the, the outcomes of these cases, and um, but basically there uh, there were three cases um, that were. Um, adjudicated uh, by the Supreme Court in the um, probably late 1820s to the mid 1830s um, by uh, Chief Justice John Marshall. And this is often called the Marshall Trilogy, which um, is the basis, um, sort of the bedrock of, uh, of Indian federal law in this country. And, uh, and one of the cases, um, he, uh, he had to basically, uh, he had two men, both of them non-natives, right? And, um, and they had purchased land um, one from the same plot of land, they had title to the same plot of land, one had gotten title from the tribe, and the other one had gotten title from the state, and he had to discern, discern to decide which title was valid, right, kind of a Solomon sort of question, and, um, and so he actually, uh, you know, this was a brand new country, there wasn't a lot of case law uh, to go back on. So he would draw from a lot of sources um, internationally. And in this, this situation, he looked at Vatican law. And there were a couple of papal bulls, one passed in 1491 and one passed in 1550, where the Pope um, ruled uh, basically uh, that it, it was with a um, sort of a, a conflict between um, Portugal and Spain over colonization, right? And um, and he basically ruled that um, that only uh, uh, discovering Christian countries could have title to the land they discovered, right? Um, so this is how they. Uh, this is this is still active law to this day, and it's called the doctrine of discovery. Uh, it basically uh, says that that we. Uh, that we don't have title to our land because we are not discovering Christian countries, right? So native nations don't have title to the land under this, um, this sort of uh, mechanism. And, um, and so, and it's interesting because of course, you know, Rick Santorum was saying, well, this is a Christian country. And you know, he's right. Cause you know, the whole basis of the land claims of this country of the United States is because it, it is because they are, they inherited the status of being a Christian discovering country from, from England, right? This is the, this is the legal basis for your land title. And, uh, and it was actually, uh, um, it was actually cited as recently as 2000, 2005 in a case, uh, City of Cheryl, New York versus the Oneida Na Nation of New York. And mm -hmm. in that case, um, Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg wrote the decision and she cited the doctrine of discovery that, that the Oneida Nation could not have title. Um, they, um, the uh, City of Cheryl had signed some bogus uh, um, sort of uh, rent uh kind of rent agreement from the with the tribe back in the late 1890s and and they would do this thing where they'd give them a dollar every year and some little trinkets and then in the 1990s they realized that their uh their little uh a rental agreement was up for renegotiation and they were pretty unhappy so they took it to the supreme court and the supreme court ruled that the tribe did not have the title jackie um Great, thank you. So, um, so uh, both of you, Allison and Jackie, there is a question in the chat that I think we'll get to in a second. But before we get to that, I think it'd be interesting to have both of you um, think about that question. And it is something, Jackie, that you, when we briefly met a couple of weeks ago, you actually said, and I and I think this was it just stuck with me. Um, you know, the question is for for white people is how can we be good colonizers, right? Um, so Kara has a nice question in the chat about that, but there's a question in the Q&A from Marcel for Jackie. Can you speak more about the connection to the Black uh, Lives Matter movement? 
Oh, you're you're muted. Yes, I forgot. Yeah. yeah uh, so, you know, what I what I find so I mean, you know, the without the leadership of the black um, of black Americans, so much of what uh, Indian country has tried to achieve over the years would not be possible. Uh, and um, and so I just want to you know put that out there and and um, and thank them for what they do. I mean, the um, the basis of, of of this country is is based on a couple of pillars, and one of them is is slavery. You know, and the uh, and the creation of um, of racism. You know, I, I go in in the book about uh, about how uh, how uh, after Bacon's rebellion in in colonial Virginia, uh, where you have uh, you know European indentured servants, poor, um, less successful planters, and also um, you know um, you know black folks, Africans, um, you know stolen from Africa, uh, held in bondage, um, uniting together, you know, to fight the planter elite. And um, and then is, is confronted with this, where um, they begin uh, the elite begin to institute um, formal um, sort of a formal system of racism based on on, on color on skin color, and uh, to divide to divide and conquer, and uh, and so you know historically you know empires uh, didn't have a race based sort of um, outlook you know it was more about being a citizen of the empire you know whether having roman citizenship or what it was really a different basis of operation it wasn't based on race the race for most people was a new construct created in virginia and i, I actually when i was writing this book i traveled a few times to virginia and um and in 2018 i traveled uh i was asked to speak at the college of william and mary in williamsburg and i went to uh, of course i took the opportunity to really go deep in the whole um jamestown thing and and um and uh but i spoke to some of the students there and most of them it's a private college but most of them are from virginia and uh, and i kept seeing all these signs everywhere like virginia is the birthplace of democracy virginia is for lovers you know all those sorts of little um, things. And, and I, I told the students, I said, Virginia is the birthplace of racism. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, and it's, it's part of that um, initial DNA that we've inherited that still hasn't gone away. And, and, um, and unless we challenge the actual, um, you know, the actual mechanism of it, of, of, of the origin story itself, um, we can't, we can't uh, get rid of it. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I see Standoff as, as like a, a kind of a, a third book in a trilogy of books written by family members of my of my family. And, you know, in Vine, uh, Vine Deloria's book, uh, Custer Died for Your Sins, which came out in 1969, um, he actually did a whole chapter called The Red and the Black, which addressed the issue of the civil rights movement and um, and how Indian leaders saw it, how they understood it. And uh, and I read it again. Uh, I read that chapter again after Ferguson happened, and um, and I, I, I was you know I disagree with what he, I struggle with what he says sometimes, um, but um, I don't think the Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act were meaningless at all, which is sort of what he kind of I don't know. And um, but uh, but I felt like his critique of you know one of the things he was saying was that Indian leaders did not want civil rights; they wanted sovereignty. We, we didn't want equal rights in your, we want our own, you know, um, we don't want to be American citizens. I mean, it's, I mean, it, we want, we want our sovereignty back, you know, and um, so those were different sorts of things, but they also felt that he was saying that, um, that the, that tribal leaders uh, felt that the only leader that they really liked, uh, felt what said meaningful things was Stokely Carmichael. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, because they because because he was talking about um, sovereignty for for black communities, and um, and I think that um, uh, you know looking at Ferguson, where you have a, a majority black town, city, a small city, um, being ruled by a white uh, a white city council, you know decades after the civil rights movement, this is still going on, being with the people's lives being, you know, taken apart through violence, um, which they cannot protect themselves, uh, you know, 
you know, laws, you know, the enforcement of the police enforcement that is, you know, harassment and terrorism. I mean, what he said in the book, and I'm paraphrasing here, what he said was he said um, that um, that they felt like Stokely Carmichael's vision was more because it was aligned with their own, you know, and they felt like that, that we need space where we can be ourselves as a people and, and sing our songs and, 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 and know ourselves, you know, and that um, and that sovereignty provides that space. So. Thank you, Jackie. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so maybe um, let's look at let's maybe think about Kara's question, and we can start with Allison. Um, how can we, as colonizers, be better, do better? Yeah, um, such a good question, and I want to hear what Jackie has to say too. But I think. Um, for a start, it's, you know, Jackie talks in her book and has talked tonight about um, that what we need is a real paradigm shift in our understanding of our history as a country and our current situation. And that, you know, we need to be committed to moving past the sort of propaganda and the, the origin stories that we have that have distorted um, in many ways what the actual history is and, and commit ourselves to really understanding the history. Um, like Jackie said, her reaction to um, the Bundys and was like, no, don't, don't, why are you surprised? Or to the white ranchers, like, why are you surprised your land's being taken away? Like, don't you know your history? So, you know, and I think, I think one way to do that is to read um, the voices of indigenous and scholars of color and center their voices and their understanding of the world, read Jackie's book and Jackie's family trilogy <laughs> and understand those voices and, you know, listen to the experiences of others. I think, you know, there's so much that we that we that we have that's received knowledge um, that has been given to us because it benefits the people who've delivered that knowledge to us. And that I found so starkly in this book on plastic that, you know, plastic um, waste is not an accident of this miracle new technology. Like plastic is inherent in the profit model of the industry. Like in the 50s, um, after the war, when plastic production was taking off, the, the industry very deliberately started a campaign to convince people to throw plastic away because it lasts forever and you can't make a profit off of something that lasts forever. So people were keeping their disposable cups and their styrofoam coffee cups, people who'd lived through the depression in World War II and who were used to conserving. And so there was a, you know, this one executive said the future of plastic is in the trash can. And, and then when industry figured out like the blister pack and clear packaging, then that is the way that you can make the most profit is to produce things that have an inherently short life and get thrown away. And that's why most of the biggest single use of plastic today is packaging. Plastic has many great um, functions. I'm not anti-plastic whole cloth. It has many great functions. It makes airplanes lighter and, you know, less hard on the planet. It makes cars safer. Um, plastic is not a terrible thing writ large, but the fact that we use um, a technology that lasts forever for disposable functions is, it's literally just not sane, right? It is, and it's driving us to our doom, that and the other technologies that we use that contribute to that. And so I, and, and the other thing that the industry did is start, people got concerned about all this plastic waste, like early on in the fifties. And there was a town in Vermont that banned single use items, like way back in the fifties and the industry went, uh Oh, and they said, let's start an anti-littering campaign and put the impetus for plastic waste onto individuals. So those of us who are around my age, I'm 50, um, might remember the Keep America Beautiful campaign that was funded by Coca-Cola and the packaging industry. And some of us may remember the so-called crying Indian who was not an indigenous person. He was an Italian actor who was paid to play an Indian in films and in these ads because no indigenous people were hired for those roles. Um, and, but that was this message, one of this American mythology, right, of our past, and two, that it's our fault. And the tagline for that campaign was, um, people pollute, people start pollution, people can stop pollution. 
So right on the individuals. And now we can't even conceive because we have that paradigm deep in our um, ec whole economic structure. We, it's hard for us to keep, even conceive of the fact that corporations who produce this waste should be responsible for it at the end of its life. So one of the things that I do in the book with this big plastic car part, which is here with me tonight, the plastic car part <laughs> that I traveled with across country um, with my family to take it back to the Honda Odyssey plant that it came from in Lincoln, Alabama, which is all where all the world's Honda Odysseys are built. Uh, ask them to take it back. And the book sort, sort of ends at, at this moment where um, my, at the time, eight-year-old daughter that I co-parent asked her, presented this carpet to them and asked them to take it back. And sort of the last line of the book is the Honda representative saying, we can't take that, it's yours. And that to me felt like such a symbolic moment about telling this child, like, this is your waste to deal with. We've bequeathed it to you. Um, there's some good news. There are many people who recognize this as a problem. And there is a bill that our own Senator Jeff Merkley introduced in Congress called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act just introduced last month. And one of the things it was, would do is put a moratorium on new plastic plants being built until um, companies take in, or until the government takes into account the accumulative effects of pollution on these communities, because these are communities that are already literally dying from pollution. So it puts a moratorium on new plastic plants and it requires corporations to take responsibility for the waste. So that, you know, we go put things in our recycle bins, much of it is never recycled. We pay for that with our taxes. Corporations pay for none of that. They call it an external cost. It ends up nowhere in their books, right? The plastic you see inside of sea turtles and all that stuff, it's nowhere in their books. It doesn't hurt their profits at all. So this, this would require them to actually pay for that and take responsibility for it. As you can imagine, even before the bill was introduced, the industry um, had a press conference saying it should be dead on arrival. And it seemed to have worked. One of the top lobbyists in Washington, um, the American Chemistry Council, the bill has kind of dropped out of public notice and hasn't gone anywhere. It was also introduced last year and it dropped out of public notice. So um, give your props to our Oregon Senator Merkley for his leadership on this and support that bill if you can. That's the kind of paradigm, the sorts of paradigm change we need just basically for our survival on the planet. Um, but as colonizers, that's like a tiny piece of all of the paradigm shifting we need to do, right? To really understand our history and what our relationships are to um, the other groups in this nation that we live with. So that's just one little thing from me. So I, um, well, I think that the, uh... Uh, the paradigm shift cannot just exist in our heads or in our personal activities. And the sad thing is that, you know, why is, uh, you know, will, will Senator um, Merkley's bill make it through? You know, of course, we know that Congress is also at a standoff, right, fueled by these exact same um, cultural paradigms, um, you know, that are held by um, all the Republicans in lockstep, you know. And, uh, and so it, this requires more than a, um, a, a, an intellectual change in paradigm. This requires an actual structural change. And, uh, and what I actually suggest is, is uh, um, what I have been talking about, and I don't think I really put this in the book, but um, uh, as, a, as a federal indigenous government uh, to actually uh, really uh, give sovereignty to tribes uh, and, and to return lands particular lands that have been agreed upon under treaty. Um, so, you know, when I, I give this lecture about how the U.S. is still a colony, right? And uh, I, I've given it, I gave it at the uh, Unitarian Church in downtown Portland a couple of years ago. And and I, I usually turn to my audience, you know, who are really mostly, um, you know, very, uh, you know, um, progressive, uh, well-meaning uh, white people. And, and I, you know, and I tell them, you know, like you, so you're a colonist, right? But you're a good person. You're a moral person, right? Well, then the question of your very existence as a colonist is what would ethical colonialism look like, right? And uh, this is like every uh, all, every American. This, if, if you're not indigenous or, or you're not, you know, descendant of people who were held in bondage, um, then this is the question of your existence, of your of your entire being, why, why you exist. And uh, and so, 
you know, I think uh, it, it does, you know, there has to be a point where we sit down at the table and, and we, re, we, we remake this world together uh, in a way that is respectful. And, and I think I, um, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that I had been asked actually um, by a local Native arts organization to write a land back essay. And I, I missed the deadline on it. Uh, my, I'm a very slow writer sometimes. And, uh, and I, uh, but I'm still working on it. I haven't stopped working on it. And, um, and actually another outlet asked me to write about it just this past week again. And, um, but uh, I really, I, I did a lot of research and, and I wanted to look at how the land was taken here in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, neither of my tribes are located here in, in the Oregon, what was the Oregon Territory. Um, and, um, and what I found was something kind of surprising. I actually, uh, I, I, it was, I was, uh, I found on YouTube, this series of videos done by the, the mayor of the city of Vancouver in British Columbia. Right. And he's looking at, um, the Chinook, uh, Wawa, which was the jargon, uh, trade jargon language that was developed here and on the Columbia river. Um, you know, Vancouver, uh, used to be, you know, the Vancouver that we have in Washington state across the river from Portland, um, you know, used to be, uh, was sort of moved up to Br British Columbia. They were, they were, it was a successor city for the British empire, um, to administer the area. And, um, what, once the, um, once the, um, the, uh, the U S had gained, um, the right to this, um, territory and, um, and, and, and he made some pretty interesting arguments. I have to say, and I am going over them a bit now, um, with research, but, um, but that the, you know, we always hear about the fur trade and we think, I always thought of the fur trade as sort of a, sort of a, a vanguard to, um, capitalistic, um, takeover and, and oppression, but, um, looking at the analysis of how the trade, um, how the fur trade actually operated here in Oregon territory. I, it gave me pause. Um, for one, they weren't allowed to bring um, missionaries. The, um, the, the company, the fur trade company called the Northwesterners actually forbade it. Um, and, um, and then also that the, the company was run by a lot of um, mixed bloods, you know, Metis people from the Red River Metis communities up in Canada, right, which have recognition um, from the Canadian um, uh, government and um and a lot of them came down here and they were um you know they and uh, and so the development of a trade language the development and, and the way the fur trade worked they didn't try to dispossess the tribes of their homelands they traded with them it was a win-win situation um you know and um and within 12 years of the u.s taking over right um most of the tribes um it had been um decimated uh, they had been dispossessed of their homelands. They'd been, I mean, a lot of the reservations here in Oregon are called confederated. And the reason is, is because that's where all the survivors went. You know, you have a lot of tribes on one reservation. These are, these are survivors of genocide, right? And, uh, and so it's, um, it, it's, uh, you know, it really is quite compelling that there are other ways to do it. You know, it doesn't have to be just this way. And my hope is with the, you know, um, the, um, the emergence of new leadership, um, Particularly, um, you know, looking at leaders like AOC and and the Squad and and uh, and um, um, Stacey Abrams and and of course, you know, I'm really um, really proud. So, you know, of what I've seen, um, uh, sec sec the Interior Secretary uh, Deb Holland, who is a, a Laguna Pueblo woman, who was one of the first Native women um, elected to Congress. Um, I think she's been doing an excellent job, and uh, and so uh, it's amazing to have. Um, so much the land in this uh, in the United States under the control of a native woman, you know, and um, and so yeah, I, I'm I think that you know we we have, but it has to be a structural change because it's the structures that produce these problems, um, these outlooks, you know, where you have ninety percent of people, you know, voting for Trump and storming the Capitol. This is a structural problem. It's not an individual problem. Just like plastic is not an individual problem, um, it's it's a structural problem. We have to change the actual structure, and, and you know, it happens. You know, I mean, how many times have the French like? change their republic do you know what I mean what, what which republic are they on now you know it, it's not a it's not a big deal we can do this you know so jackie and allison thank you so much for such a wonderful evening and great readings from your work um i'm gonna paste the links into the chat i hope you all will um rush out virtually and um, get copies of these books. Here they are. 
Thanks to everybody for attending. And thank you again, Kara, for helping me introduce. Oh yeah, nice. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us, Jackie. I think that was the